Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hope you can hear me. Um, welcome to the Rocker London Gallery this evening. Thank you very much for braving uh, at least one tube strike, possibly two, to get here. Ah, there we go. Uh, I'm Will Hurst, Managing Editor of the Architects Journal. And uh, as I said, uh, welcome to this wonderful Zaha Hadid Design Gallery for the AJ's very first In Conversation With event. It's my huge pleasure tonight to be introducing one of the most exciting talents in UK architecture, Amin Taha. Amin will be discussing the historical precedents in art and architecture, which have informed his award-winning practice group work in Amin Taha and three of its key projects. There will also be a chance afterwards for our, us to ask him questions and we'll be live streaming the talk on the AJ website. Before I hand over to him, I would like to say a special thank you to our sponsor, Rocca, for hosting us tonight and supporting the AJ's new In Conversation With series. I also need to tell you that in the unlikely event of the fire alarm going off, this is not a drill and there is a fire, so you should evacuate the building immediately, please, and gather at Imperial Wharf train station. After the Q&A, please do stick around as we have some canapes and drinks to enjoy, which will be served until nine o'clock. And you're also very welcome to explore Rocker's current exhibition. Rocker's international specification manager, Mark Poulain, is here tonight. So do please seek him out and say hello after the talk. So without further ado, I will now hand over to tonight's speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Amin Taha. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start with um, a question that we get asked that I think is probably relevant to all of us. Uh, we get quite asked quite often, what is your style? Um, why do your buildings tend to look differently one from the other? Is that mic okay? Yeah. So it's a question I think is relevant to all of us. Uh, um, uh, and the answer, um, uh, so indulge me for, for, for a couple of minutes before we actually get into some projects. Uh, the answer really is, uh, lies, uh, I think, uh, as, as a starting point with Giorgio Vasari in the middle of the 16th century. So if you know Giorgio Vasari, uh, he wrote, if you like, the first history of architecture and art, the, uh, the um, lives of um, the most excellent artists, sculptors and architects. Uh, he actually included himself among, amongst them. It's actually written about 150 years of what we would term today as the beginning of the Renaissance. Now, the key aspect of Vasari's book, it's not what we would call architecture history today. It's much more anecdotal. So he's, um, he's taking particular uh, artists and architects and sculptors, talking about their lives, how they innovated um, uh, worked, if you like, apprentice to, to some artists and um, innovated and, and developed who they were working for and became, um, um, if you like, excellent in their own right. So some of those would have been silversmiths. That was the baptistry gates. Uh, for those of you who are, um, who will spot this, it's not actually a, a Florentine artist, it's a German, but of that period. So each one of those are he defines as innovators in their own right. Their, their, their art and architecture is the biography of them themselves, what they've worked for, how they've worked, how long they've worked for particular, um, uh, uh, been apprenticed for particular um, masters, if you like. Uh, and those are uh, innovations in, in drawing and then ultimately um, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, um, development of actual physical form. 200 years later, we have um, Johann Winkelmann, and this is the period of the Enlightenment, so this is much more rational, and he gives birth to the idea of archaeology as a scientific um, uh, discipline. So he's mapping um, the stones that most people would have, on the Grand Tour, would have sketched, but he's actually mapping them, uh, reconstructing, if you like, those fallen stones, and, uh, uh, and giving a, a, a timeline of when sculptures are excavated as well as architecture is being excavated. So. Uh, in his first book, it's effectively the history of art in antiquity. His second book, 
actually is where I think, um, I don't want to call it where it started going wrong, but there's a sort of a worse definition, if you like, of style, the, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, let's leave it at that. So one of the aspects that he, um, and he wasn't to know, obviously, at that time, uh, that he conflated in his, uh, in his second book, uh, which is much more about his personal opinions, as it were, is the idea that Greek is better than Roman, and Ro Greek is better than Roman because ultimately Greeks were more democratic than Imperial Romans, and um, uh, uh, conflating their sense of proportions, the use of those proportions, not just in architecture, but also in sculpture, uh, with uh, the idea that they're de democratic. And you have to remember, he's working at a time of the Enlightenment, so they're really battling the idea of, of um, Im imperialists, monarchists, um, and um, um, they're trying to develop the idea of being uh, on, on the humanist line, if you like. As a result of that, um, I mean, this is obviously what we know today. So he's very much conflating the idea that pure white marble um, and its beauty is 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 um, is um, uh, associated with um, democracy and independence, and obviously, actually, they looked like that in the past. Now, uh, the, the danger. This is where I. This is where I say maybe it went wrong. Uh, the danger of uh, conflating and um, and uh, if you like, um, studying and then conflating without understanding how things are made. So previously, the Sari would have been talking about the biographies, the, the methods of making, the, uh, the 10,000 hours of apprenticeship and learning and innovation, while Winkelmann is much more a broader study, analysis of what's, what's on the ground, and giving it a noun, as it were. So the difference between the verb and the noun. And the danger is, of course, the origins uh, and meanings are actually lost because they're given a different meaning altogether, a different layer of meaning. Um, and the origins there might have been actually the way things were constructed in timber before they were then represented in stone. Which then obviously, during the 18th century, 19th century, leads to a neoclassical um, uh, architectural style, uh, which is then next generation, uh, depending on where you are, is either Baroque or Beaux-Arts or um, uh, Gothic Revival i.e. one style after another, uh, that all of you, including us, are adopting until some point in the mid-20th mid century, uh, late mid-20th century, where we're thinking of, um, of um, um, a sort of postmodern period, as it were. Now, imagine if that was actually multicolored, it'd have a different imperial meaning altogether, wouldn't it? Um, interestingly, the idea of whiteness um, transcended the neoclassical into modernism. And I, say, I guess our argument is that um, the danger of that is that we, we, we see um, style as, uh, as literally a, um, a sort of two-dimensional form, whether it's in drawing or, or photographs, uh, without actually understanding how that built form came about. And as architects, obviously, our, our vocabulary, our language, Every building has a story, if you like, our, our narrative of the building is ultimately the vocabulary of that is the materials that we work with, whether they're traditional, highly modern and contemporary, whether it's plastics or you name it, all of them have tactile, visual, um, uh, structural uh, characteristics. Um, and if you understand them and you use them, you can, you can deploy them to tell a particular story. That story might be very traditional and prosaic, because of the particular brief you've got, or it might be more poetic ultimately. But I'll, I think on the next slide might say why. Now, most people think I'm being um, disparaging about this sort of product. It's not the product itself, because obviously it's just an inert um, material. It's ultimately what it's, how it's going to be used and why. And there's a number of reasons you should ask why you might use it, because ultimately this is actually more expensive than real bricks. So you might use it uh, in, in situations where you can't use real bricks. Um, I mean, this is actually the construction method. So you can see there's a superstructure behind there, and they're using timber then to hold up what is effectively a pretend load-bearing structure. And that's really my only criticism of this sort of use, uh, 
is that this material is pretty much handmade before it's fired in a factory. You can make any pattern you like out of that terracotta. It doesn't have to represent load bearing or even in that case, stringer, uh, um, uh, stretcher bond um, brick. It's a skin, so why not use it as a skin? Use it as a curtain wall. Don't hit it to the ground. Leave it elevated by a meter or so, so it, 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 it's, it appears of, uh, uh, of what it is, i.e. a curtain wall, if you like. I think that takes us to our first um, built project. That's pretty much the reason we don't use brick very often is because there's a uh, normal uh, uh, conventional demand by the contractor that then is working on behalf of the client to say, well, we do brick. We'll, we'll, um, we'll, um, we'll tell you exactly how that is going to be formed on the, uh, as the skin. And it's often the misuse of brick, therefore. Uh, and we struggled with the idea that uh, with that particular client, but eventually we persuaded him that actually, given that bricks are, real bricks are cheaper than the cladding, uh, and ultimately any brick construction today, almost none of it is load bearing. All it's doing is sitting on the outside of a building as a rain screen. So why actually bond it together, make it look like it's a solid wall, whether it's stretcher or you're pretending it's some sort of other Flemish bond, structural bond, open it up to allow it to be a, a, a breathable rain screen. And then in addition, if you allow it, each one of those bricks is made as, exactly as it was several hundred years ago, same proportion, same strength, allow it to sit as a load-bearing facade. In other words, it's just taking its own weight all the way up. And this is not to do with necessarily just moral reasons of, of materials and how they're used, but actually it's much more practical. And if you want to triangulate that for your client, it's actually cheaper, much cheaper. So this building was about 25% cheaper than conventional build of the development next door. Because what you're doing is essentially saying this facade is allowed to move separately from the timber superstructure internally which means that the timber structure no longer needs brick hangers, which means that the superstructure isn't as heavy as it needs to be, because you can imagine carrying bricks on every floor. It means the foundations aren't as heavy as they need to be normally. Um, and the superstructure can obviously then uh, move independently, meaning that you don't have lots of expansion joints everywhere either. So there are, um, uh, in addition to, if you like, um, the traditional, what we used to call um, uh, honesty to materials, are actually very fundamental practical reasons once you understand the nature of those materials, not just for your own satisfaction, but actually for, if you like, a client's um, um, outcome. So there's the sort of diagram, a simple diagram of uh, a CLT load bearing structure, holds itself up, fair faced on the interior, and just a skin that drops on top. And you might ask, well, why a pitched roof? Why run the bricks across? We've done a number of exercises on other buildings for other clients where we asked ourselves if the Victorians and Georgians managed to build mass housing really inexpensively, how on earth can we do it today? And obviously at the end of, at the end of it all, it still has character. Um, well, the easiest way of doing that is to drop as many different trades. So here you're dropping your, your, your roofer, people put the gutters in, you're dropping your normal window reveal people and all the rest of it. You're allowing basically a certified product to run up waterproofing all the way across and all the way down. Um, and then similarly with the, with the skin of it. So you're dropping trades, you're dropping materials, you're dropping program at time on site as it were. Those of you can actually see it. If you're interested, there's the detail, very simple CLT all bolted together, a floating floor, everything's left exposed, insulation, vapor barrier, and then very conventionally, a rain screen. So in this case, self-supporting. Uh, and then occasionally you're allowed some, if you like, uh, more um, poetic flourishes. It's housing. So the three projects you're gonna look at, they're all different types of housing. This is actually the most um, uh, inexpensive in terms of its construction, uh, it's just client demand at that time. And um, uh, the challenge for us was um, if we're making it out of these bricks, do we use a grain that is the brick itself or do we double stack it to make it look heavier given that it's actually quite a slender facade? 
and then open it up to, um, to, to, to sort of give it a, well, one, explain that it's actually a rain screen and not load bearing holding up the whole building. And then after that, these balconies, you know, how they're held up, they, they need to be large enough to put a dining table and uh, house people, but we don't want to run across the facade and, and block direct light to every window. So alternate them and make them pop out perpendicular. That's actually, if you can just see there, it's actually a lattice truss just bolted back to the um, timber. And then the challenge is, well, if you make that out of glass or perforated metal, uh, it's got a certain character, certainly glass, what tends to happen, people will obviously place their belongings there. Before you know, you have bicycles and storage and broken down washing machines. And that's actually given the slenderness of that facade. After all that careful composition, your elevation really is the sort of detritus, if you like, of our day-to-day -day living, me included. So what tends to happen, and you probably notice that people put rattan screens on their, on their, um, on their glazed um, lower balconies especially. So we thought, well, let's predict that, preempt that, and, um, and, and weave that through the lattice structure. That's the interior. The struggle with the interior was um, persuading the client through their agents that um, people would actually buy all timber interiors. Because uh, agents, you know, they'll, they'll, um, they'll always look backwards to what was previously sold and it's normally conventional uh, plaster, white painted plasterboard. We persuaded the client, look, you're saving a huge amount of money by not employing an army of plasterers and buying the capital cost on the plastering itself. If you can't sell in any of them, then you've saved six months on site and that capital cost, you can, you can just whitewash it or plaster it if you like. They actually ended up um, selling for more than, um, than the conventional development next door. We've given a budget for some of the, um, the ironmongery, so we um, spent that on um, specialist locks, which is a vast amount of money, but it's part of that philosophy that if there's an overall strategy to, to the architecture, then some of the tactile, smaller elements need to be um, a bit more special. All right. Uh, on a different scale, a slightly different scale, um, so that the story there, if you like, the narrative to that, to that, to Barrett's Grove is, if you like, conventional construction mass housing. This is slightly different, where the budget's slightly, um, slightly better. Uh, and here, like all our projects, instead of immediately coming up with an idea, drawing something, the first few weeks are spent surveying, drawing the area, and surveying, if you like, the social history. So layer by layer through the through the. Um, through the um, local context. At the top, that's Smithfield there, and that's Clerkenwell close there. And you can see it's an, a sort of walled enclave. Resolution's not so good, but you can spot it there. It's, that's the first structure that existed in the area. And that's a Norman, uh, originally Norman built nunnery, Augustin, Augustinian nunnery, uh, that lasted for 500 years until Henry VIII dissolved it with Duke of Newcastle taking it as his palace. Uh, a couple of hundred years later, Oliver Cromwell kicked, kicked the family out, built his own palace and seat of government there until his death. The aristocrats retook the land, demolished his, his home, built some more housing on it. London boomed and William Morris actually set up uh, the 20th century press for whom Karl Marx was writing there in that location. It's now the Karl Marx Library, the building next door to us. Lenin also wrote there, but he wrote his um, Russian language paper there, not William Morris's. And that's our site there. Um, and that, that's still the center for, if you like, um, um, change, change makers, um, activism, if you like. Um, we looked at a number of um, options. And if you're interested in asking why we settled on Stern, you can ask me later. But um, eventually, just so we stay within timeline, so I can see Will sort of arching one eyebrow. <laughs> um, one of the options was stone. Uh, the challenge for us was um, the stone partly came out of this vast amount of uh, limestone construction, Portland stone construction in, in London especially, uh, often facing and just like that question for Barrett's Grove and that detail you saw the brick, you walk past most stone buildings, most stone clad buildings today, 
and you'll see that maybe there's a team of four men spending a week actually clipping on stone tiles to a column. And you wonder, well, what on earth has happened to um, our construction method that, that we think that's a sensible solution. There must be another way of doing it. So we asked stonemasons we were working with on, a, on one of those special staircases that spans from one floor to the other. So we, uh, we, we thought, well, they must, they must have an idea, a better idea. And if you don't know, in this country, unfortunately, we don't educate stonemasons to do anything apart from decoration. On in France, they still do a proper long course and they're, they're educated in construction and structural um, uh, abilities of stone. And they very quickly told us it's perfectly normal in France to still build in load-bearing stone. In fact, immediately after the war, it was called austerity construction because it was cheaper than, than, stone, um, than concrete and, and steel. Uh, so we knew immediately, yes, structurally possible. Had to work with an engineer and find out, well, why is nobody doing it? Well, engineer thought uh, from his perspective is to do with progressive collapse. So if you take one column out, all the other columns want to drop. Uh, quantity surveyor saying was, well, it's just ludicrously expensive. Are you sure about that? Well, I don't know. That's probably why everybody's not doing it. So no one's really asking the questions. They're just making assumptions because we've become normalized after a generation or two of doing it a certain way, conventional forms of construction uh, that are pretty much dictated to us by contractors because they don't know any better either. And they, they follow their convention and, uh, and, and don't really want to deviate from it because of the risks, potential risks. So we pushed with quantity surveyors, with structural engineers and our stonemasons, and we got a price back that was effectively um, a quarter of what it would be if we say built it in brick or clad it in brick or even clad it in stone. In other words, if we put a steel frame or a concrete frame up and then clad it in brick stone or even try to make it out of, out of brick. So it's significantly, um, uh, cheaper and that's partly in the last 20 years the extraction of stone has got a lot cheaper and I'll show you why that is if you like a giant cheese wire with industrial diamonds on it that slices all the way along the quarry bed one long block as it were and then the previous slide is a chap who's then this used to be done by hand is then cutting uh, these holes there that then subdivide the long sausage into smaller sausages, as, as it were. That's made stone extraction really inexpensive. And occasionally there still has to be some hand um, tooling. That basically means when you, cut, when, when you get a block out of the quarry, there are three types of finish. The saw cut by the cheese wire, the sedimentary layer, and the drilling. Talk to any stone mason uh, when they come to your offices and they will give you a spectrum of finishes. Uh, some of that spectrum is called natural. And you ask yourself, well, what is natural? Well, natural still flame textured, chiseling it, because they get um, delivered to, to their, uh, to their um, yard, clean cut blocks. So it wasn't until we visited the, the quarry itself, the quarry master told us, these are the natural finishes. And occasionally you'll get ammonite shells and quartz pockets in them. We asked, well, what do you do to this if you send it to the, to the stonemasons? I have to cut it off, crush it for road fill. Uh, to give the stonemason his clean block, he can then carve in natural. Yeah. So completely perverse again. Um, and even the stonemason didn't realize that you get occasionally this sort of um, finishes, natural finishes, if you like. So before we are we have to answer the question, is it structurally possible? And is it uh, then after it's structurally cost, cost um, uh, uh, um, possible? Uh, how do we dress it? This is just testing how a metal boss will be grouted into the back of a, a beam, two beams, which is then fixed to, um, if you see these here, which are already cast into the slab. So this is all on temporary props. There's a male and female fixing. One's cast into the slab, and the other one then just is grouted into, into the back of the beams. That's them being lifted into place. So you've got... Two party walls, our neighbors, and then this um, excess skeleton of a grid of stone running all, up, all the way up the building, which basically means there's no columns inside at all, which is that idea that you have effectively a, uh, an open plan that one day in the future, in 20 years' time, somebody can come along and, and completely scrub this layout, and there'll be open plan offices or one large apartment or even subdivided. <clears throat> 
that is it in this context. I suspect lots of you have seen lots of these photographs before. I never know quite what to say when there's just photographs. Just, uh, 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 the, um, the, uh, the addition of details like this at ground level. So you remember Barrett's Grove had um, wicker balconies, door, special door handles. These are all to do with when you come to a building, you've had the larger concept. As you then step into the next um, scale, the tactile scale, it's the door handles. <coughs> The other thing is you, you touch and see at close proximity as opposed to the building as a whole. The same here. So here we've got a part carved ionic capital in one of the fallen columns. And it's part carved and fallen because what it's telling you in a sort of English um, 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 romantic tradition, neoclassical tradition, if you like, um, it's actually dating the time of the, the, the fall of the monasteries. So, Renaissance happened quite late in England. So this is the Ionic coming to England at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries. Ionic because the Ionic is associated with female um, principal goddesses of both Greek and, uh, and Roman. Principally here referring to Roman because Venus is born from the, um, from the foaming sea sits on the shell. And the shell that you normally see um, associated with that is nowadays associated with um, St. James or Santiago de Compostela for the Spanish people here, and those you've got on the pilgrimages. Um, and that's our church opposite. Church opposite is a new church, <coughs> an 18th century church that scrubbed out the, what was left over of the nunnery, St. Mary's Chapel and the rest of the nunnery. So effectively, all it's saying, plus all these various details, it's saying that um, um, we might think we are um, highly contemporary and, and uh, um, new, everything we do is new, but actually what all we're doing is adopting um, traditions of the past and perhaps um, um, developing uh, them sometimes slightly, sometimes uh, subconsciously, sometimes very consciously. So as, as in here, these are the interiors of the office and the interiors of the apartments. Uh, biodiverse roofs. So most of you, I mean, all, ninety percent of you work on um, buildings with flat roofs, and of course nowadays, if you want to build your flat roof, you have to have a biodiverse roof, not just a sedum roof. In addition to that, ticking that box, you also have to have water attenuation somewhere, and that's depending on the scale of your roof. Before you know, you've actually built an, a sub basement, an underground swimming pool, and pumps are uh, con constantly going and taking this water to different parts of the building. We actually thought. You don't want to build another basement just for that. One, it's highly costly and it doesn't seem like a very sustainable idea. So we worked with our landscape architect and horticulturalist who came up with the idea that if you plant four trees of a certain scale, certain root ball, they will absorb about 80, yeah, 80 to 90% percent of the annual rainfall, London's annual rainfall, giving you a buffer for dry periods and the low lying um, 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 greenery, which we thought was actually far better green roof and biodiverse um, uh, solution. Okay, so that's taking you from something that's very prosaic in its narrative uh, to something that is still uh, uh, structurally um, narrative driven, but having some references to the past, to a scheme where we were really questioning where on earth do we start with this? This is um, Hyde Park and that red dot, if you can just about see it, is on Bayswater Road between um, Inverness Terrace and Queensway. It's really one of the last end of um, blocks facing the park. It gives you an opportunity to create a, um, a mansion house. Um, again, similarly to the other projects, instead of drawing something immediately, uh, you do some research in the area. And on the corner of Inverness Terrace and Bayswater Road is this um, uh, oddity for that area because everything else is pretty much inexpensive standard stucco but here's a fine uh, cut stone um, um, grand house grand townhouse and you wonder you do a bit of research a bit of digging and you quickly find it's actually built uh, by the um, Prince of Wales at the time later King uh, Queen Victoria's oldest son for his mistress um, Lily Langtree if you, if some of you might know it, if you don't, go and visit it. 
it's a hotel now, but the ground floor is completely retained as it was. And at the back of it, which is the bar, I think, is this, a mini proscenium arch theater with some seating, which is clearly where he would then bring his friends and she would perform because she was a famous actress, musical actress, I think, some of you don't, don't, don't know at the time. The building was built by uh, uh, Muse Davis, who they were prominent architects at the time, so they Ritz Hotel, the RAC Club, uh, buildings like that, all, all across the city as well as outside. Uh, very conventional in terms of you have one bay, which is very repetitive. And then if they did, when you study their buildings, pretty much like most neoclassical buildings, uh, across its breadth, a central piece, two wings, and then some um, changes at either, either end and center to define the overall. So we began to draw, if you like, the plan. And all of you, I suspect, if you were given the same brief, would come up with the same, roughly the same plan. Um, our client, I wouldn't call them expert at the time, but they became more expert as time went on. We're convinced you could get probably four or five cores in there. Why not? Uh, the the lay floor layouts would be um, a, a, a multitude, but actually it makes absolute sense if there are only two cores and the layouts are X. Yeah, there's, there's hardly any likelihood that any of you would ultimately come up with any difference. Um, and that's just the nature of, um, if you like, conventional um, unit production of housing in terms of whether it's GLA areas or even agents telling you do not go above 65 square meters, 75 square meters, and all the rest of it. There's obviously some fat in there. Given that, we were, we were challenging ourselves, well, how do we drive them, the, ultimately, what the build, building looks like? There are various environmental issues. This space is south. Double-decker buses and pedestrians are walking past even. Um, this is first floor level. So there's privacy issues. Um, and we imagined um, Muse Davis uh, finishing, if you like, the urban block. So we said, well, why don't we make that out of a perforated brass screen that is actually in the fashion of Muse Davis? That gives us our environmental control, cuts down the amount of solar gain into what is otherwise a fully glazed um, uh, floor layout. Um, as well as dealing with privacy issues and then perhaps activate some of those uh, to give you some variety and, um, um, and, and, and tell us also that actually the floor lines are nothing to do with the Muse Davis period, but they are you know, brutally cutting through what would other be, otherwise be their, their facade. We took that to planning. And I don't know how many of you have sat in front of Robert Davis at the time. Um, he's no longer there. Uh, but um, it was, uh, he's, uh, he's, it's his word was literally, you know, this sort of business. And uh, I've cut a long story short, he went like that. And um, uh, it, it did not happen. <laughs> not for us, anyway. Somebody else took it on. And I think they've done a probably fantastic job. I think I've seen a plan, and it is exactly how it's predicted, back to those um, two cores and the floor layout's almost identical. About two years later, I think we're doing okay for time. Yeah. Um, two years later, this is the last one. Um, we were invited on a competition on Upper Street in Islington. Uh, a bombed out site on what was really a Victorian uh, uh, watered down version of a Palladian facade. So again, you have your central piece wings and two pavilions, but effectively, it's a facade on party wall shop fronts with uh, the shop owners living above. So the end piece is missing. There are five other entrants, I think, and we, I think we were only given about two or three weeks. So it was really ideas, immediate ideas. Give us your immediate ideas and we'll choose from, from those. And I think they really wanted to take them to, uh, to planners they already knew and informally have a discussion. Um, we oh, it's a short period to do that sort of um, study and what might occur there and five, six architects are all going to do something within a certain language parameter that's not too too different as it were. Uh, so we thought actually if we've done this exercise before why don't we um, deploy the idea of bringing back the past. While Bayswater was an imagined past so it's a complete fiction of how Muse Davis might have um, finished their, um, their um, 
the, the, the rest of their block. This is actually a monument to literally the past. So it's re reconstruction of what was there. I'm, I say monument because um, 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 it's not so much saying it was bombed, but if we're recreating uh, and representing the past in that sort of monument tradition, does that give us an opportunity of how we write narratives in the same way that you might write a, a monument? And obviously the flaw with most monuments is that narrative is, is, is particular to the people erecting that monument, sometimes um, not in, in, in tune with others, even in, in, in that generation, let alone several generations later. So we thought it'd be interesting if we choose a material that is flawed. So it's effectively telling us it's a flawed narrative right from the outset. So we chose um, uh, an in-situ in -situ concrete. Um, I think I'm gonna go straight. I mean, this is, tells you how it's made. So you have a, sh a shell that is the cast monument. And then internally, it's the inhabitation, the 20th century or 21st century inhabitation uh, with then um, our 20th century cutting through the old. But I'm gonna, so yeah, sorry, let me go back to how it's made. So there we take, uh, we took a survey. Again, we had to demonstrate, um, I, won't spend, I won't labor the point, but I don't know if there are any QSs here. It, same way that we graduate with certain conventions, QSs will also graduate with the cost plan book. And uh, uh, here, um, it took some time, but the QS eventually came around and understood what we were doing. The cost plan book will tell you substructure, superstructure, external finishes, internal finishes, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of those is a chapter in the cost plan book. Supposing one material actually covers a number of um, chapters, well, the problem is no chapter can be zero. So there's always a, some numbers plugged into that, despite the fact that they should be zero. So it took about three or four meetings before those chapters were ripped out and the whole thing suddenly made sense to the client because beforehand, as far as the client was concerned, the whole thing was completely out of, uh, out of budget. Well, we were sitting there in our client meetings, looking down the cost plan saying, why are there internal finishes when the superstructure has already got the full cost? I think superstructure, uh, below ground, external and internal finishes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, to, to demonstrate that this is possible, uh, the client was very patient and uh, spent a bit of money on, on, uh, on experimenting uh, to demonstrate it, was, it would, would be possible. Jason, who was a project architect at the time, had just graduated from UCL, so he made use of the model shop. They've got a robot, although they did have that time, I'm sure they still do, which routed out of a, a point cloud survey of the opposite building, the opposite wing, routed part of that detail into expanded polystyrene. So this is film industry um, um, and car industry and film industry sort of technology. Taking expanded polystyrene, carving what you like into it, finishing it in a, in a, for a set piece or being a mock-up in a, in a, for a car. That was routed. This chap actually ended up becoming the, the contractor on it. There were two contractors making two samples just to, to see what they, whether they could meet the cost as well as the finish. Reinforcement, either side is the polystyrene, and there we learn you have to put quite a lot of, um, uh, it's gone now, um, release agent um, onto the polystyrene. Otherwise, you'll end up you know, spending all day chipping a small section out, and that's the finish of it. So we we're all quite impressed with the, with the final finish. It was very perfect, which made us even more determined that we're going to have to artificially make it fail, to, to talk about a failed narrative, as it were, a flawed narrative. So things like this, normally in any, uh, in any um, specification, a uh, contractor would be condemned for that. They'd be hacked off and they'd have to make good. So they'd have to set potentially 15% of the concrete budget aside for coming back and making good those sort of patches. But that's what we wanted. The contractor was actually constantly repairing every time we left because he was convinced we were gonna, going to um, tick him off. But no, it did too many repairs actually. So in addition to the material itself having lots of flaws and talking about the flawed narrative, we then had to invent flaws. So remember each one of these, each, um, each one of these pores is a block, a series of blocks. So we took some of these blocks and deliberately, if you like, misdelivered them on the wrong day, the wrong week, upside down, inside out. Um, 
plus allowed this sort of business. So we had choices of the routing tool. The most, the finest routing tool at the moment will still give you that sort of finish. So it's still quite crude, really. And maybe in 10 years' time, it'll be far, far finer than that. So it partly dates the technology we have. You can see all sorts of flaws there. Then internally, um, uh, internally, effectively, it's just B and Q architraves and um, anaglypta wallpaper on plywood. So not phenolic ply or anything special. And then, you know, taken off to give you the actual position of those windows where the architraves and, and um, skirtings would have been in the past. And obviously the new floor plates are now intersecting at different, different levels. Okay, so all the new inhabitation is in this timber, it's a CLT again, uh, just spanning from concrete um, structure back to the party wall. I think that is, uh, that is about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, I mean, That was a superb talk, a real insight, I think, into your thinking um, and the work of your practice. Do come and join me, please, um, for some questions. So I'm sure uh, the audience will have questions, um, but let me kick things off. Um, obviously, your projects are highly individual, and there's a lot of questioning going into those projects about materials, the construction techniques, the technologies you're going to use, the history of the place. Do you see them as individual experiments or individual investigations? Um, they are. Yes, I guess so. I think every project's approached that way. Uh, I think inevitably, I mean, interestingly, I've, it's three housing projects. Uh, the, the purpose of that is that uh, housing is often pretty similar. So I deliberately haven't shown plans because I suspect most of us would plan it exactly the same way uh, until you do special one-off houses or special housing, you know, small, small one-off flats. They tend to be, they tend to want to be the same for all sorts of reasons. Uh, how you build it and therefore give characters to that particular solution, that particular site is, uh, is, is yeah, it's, it's up to that, up to us as individuals to do the research, to do that digging around in, in, its, um, in that context to see whether it begins to give you reasons for choosing particular materials um, that if before they crystallize a solution are orbiting your mind in terms of what structural purposes, cost purposes, as well as um, aesthetic purposes before they begin to sort of crystallize as a way. So inevitably the idea is that uh, there is some uh, specific solution to particular sites. My worry is that um, we haven't actually built vast amounts. So uh, there's already a number of sites in the same way as housing would, um, uh, plans would generate this roughly the same solution on different sites. You really can see that potentially some other sites are actually almost calling for the same solution. And we're thinking, well, uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with repeating the same idea. Because actually, the first time you've done it, it is an experiment. You've learned quite a lot. You also learn that there was a particular solution that might have given it a different character. And maybe that's what you exploit on the next project. The next project. How many you go before it just becomes an iterative um, uh, repetition? Um, so repetition would seem to be out of the question, given um, the history of each individual area, wouldn't it? Unless you're well, building a, a project right next to another. I don't, I, yeah, I mean. <laughs> Or whether we're all that, you know, it's nice to think we're all absolutely individuals and um, uh, we're completely different from everybody else. And areas are completely different, the sites are completely different, briefs are completely different, but they're not. So there's a vast amount of similarity, so repetition will occur. Yeah. I think there's a point in repetition uh, in any, in any uh, similar solution where it becomes a, um, almost a parody of a previous iteration that point it's the value is lost and is some of this uh, experimentation is questioning a reflection of your own personality 
uh, bound to, there's bound to be some, isn't yeah. there? That, that you want to, yeah, you're you're driven. And if so, where does that come from? Well, I mean, uh, you you, you seem to I'm, approach things almost like um, speaking as a journalist. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the sort of way I look at things. I'm always questioning yeah, things, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. not many architects, I would suggest, do go into that that deep level of questioning just, just on. Offended the. Um, I've invented, <laughs> offended the entire room. Sorry about that. Um, but you know, um, I'm not saying architects aren't questioning, but the level of your questioning is is perhaps setting you apart. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's 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 yeah, it's an interesting topic because um, if you think uh, maybe 150 years ago, so um, uh, when vast amounts of England, uh, UK was being built, especially London as well. Uh, were there that many uh, titled architects? There's vast amounts of building going on. So the builders who are financing the developers, as well as, um, if you like, their internal architects, because really most of it was pattern book construction, uh, but still needing solutions for on, 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 on ground conditions. Uh, and I would suggest that most of what we do is pretty much still that. So a vast proportion of what we actually build is housing, uh, Offices, uh, commercial, commercially orientated. Uh, so, to some degree, that that um, mass housing, that mass production, uh, is inevitable. Uh, there are special occasions, whether the public uh, institutional buildings that require special um, results. Mm -hmm. And maybe yes, you're right. Um, there's a sort of resistance where um, we have worked uh, in conditions where. We must reproduce uh, the mass conventional solution, and it's. You ask yourself, it's it's. Uh, why should you resist that? Well, uh, uh, you know, who's going to benefit apart from maybe your own um, sanity? But your client isn't interested in your sanity, really. Um, well, it's got to benefit ultimately the client and the users, and if you can, if you can therefore triangulate and, and, and seek the, their satisfaction. You're going to make everyone happy in that, and that's hence, for instance, the most prosaic. Uh, Barrett's Grove is an example of that. Any questions from the floor at this point? Open. Yes, gentleman at the front. Question about your project. Um, your last project. Um, oh, if you could say who, if you don't mind saying who you are. Oh, I, um, my name's George. Hi, George. <laughs> George Clark, right. but not the guy from Channel. Not 4. the other George. Clark. <laughs> um, so about your last project, yeah. um, how was um, the reception uh, when you took this scheme to the the planners? Um, because if you were to have approached it with just uh, a straight rebuild as it was before, I'm sure that would have been fine. Mm. But if you're looking at it the way you have, um, and in terms of maybe approaching it from sort of looking in conservation way and bringing in an interventions to that building, that would kind of generally be frowned upon to kind of move away from as it was the first time. Uh, you mean makes who, who would frown on it? The, the... Well, if, if it was standing, yeah. and built and you oh, were coming so, yeah. in as a renovation and yeah, 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 trying yeah. to you know put all the windows in and make all these changes I you see, generally yeah. wouldn't get away with it you would get away with it yeah, i don't so. think you would if it Sorry, was say it was a listed oh building. you mean if it yeah, of course not yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so you know coming in with that approach to rebuilding something but changing it dramatically so who, you mean who how was it received by yeah whoever but planners as well as a uh, client was receptive because they thought it was actually might, maybe they liked the idea of bringing back what was there, uh, somehow ec a representation of that past. Um, they also could see potentially the advantages of going to a plan department telling them you're reconstructing the old, uh, even if it was clearly not in a traditional construction method. Uh, so reasonably, well, we won the competition, so I guess reasonably well received by Client. And then similarly by um, by planners. Interestingly enough, and this is a sort of error, I guess uh, all of us have to avoid. We initially wanted to cast it into 
bronze, but uh, a conservation officer at the time uh, is much more conventional in terms of reading the the policy book and said there was no there's no bronze in the um, conservation area. It says on the policy I, you must use um, um, uh, materials that are common in the area, and in the precedence of who's done this sort of thing before. Uh, obviously, it was Rachel White Reed. I don't know if you know Do Ho So, um, Korean artist, um, who we were speci especially referencing for the bronze, as it were. Um, and we also used uh, Dina and Dina and Edward Francois. And of course, in that meeting, uh, the conservation officers flicking the pages and said, Well, I, I don't want the bronze because there's no bronze in this area. I want that one. <laughs> so uh, then the challenge is, Well, okay client wants to execute this project and we want to um, uh, potentially execute it uh, to, to our satisfaction. So there's the challenge, you know, why would ours be different? Um, well, it inevitably will be anyway, but it was, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Ultimately, it was well received despite the initial challenges with, with another material. Obviously, you're um, in the middle of a big challenge over Clerkenwell Close. I'm yeah. sure most yeah. of the audience know about that. And uh, yeah. uh, the council's uh, intention to demolish, which is very fiercely resisted by um, the architectural community, who I know have given you a lot of support. What's it been like um, to be in the centre of that row? I mean, it must be... Uh, Quite surreal at times, I imagine, with the yeah, paparazzi yeah. and <laughs> and also it's your fam. You know, you, you you've got a young family living there, so that must be be hard. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Very <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you hard um, well, to find the support that you yeah, had obviously, from, yeah, very hard. The very hard. It's very, it helps. It helps a great deal. It helps a great deal. Um, <clears throat> but it is uh, it comes back to that initial um, set of slides that I put up. Uh, where um, uh, it, it, that, that initial set of slides came about because uh, I think maybe about five years ago we were asked to contribute towards a series of debates that uh, Future Cities Institute of Ideas and others were having, and they were they were uh, I, uh, debates were, which I thought had gone. You know, they're long dead. Why are we still debating them? They're called style wars. You know, spe spe specifically about architectural styles, and there are people literally promoting different periods. So. Uh, Classical, the classical language, uh, high tech, uh, metabolism, Japanese metabolism, and there are people promoting this stuff. You know? So uh, we are asked to contribute, and <clears throat> our decision was actually it should be no style, it's titled no style. We're living in a postmodern period, whether you like it or not, it actually, it's a fact. We're living in the most postmodern period where we're all given our own freedoms. With those freedoms come a vast amount of responsibility. You have to educate yourself. Uh, you can walk around in, in uh, in, um, if you like, uh, well, sticking to architecture without digressing to people's personalities and sense of dress or anything else or personal philosophies. Uh, there's a responsibility to actually understand uh, what, you're, what you're working with. Um, so uh, hence my challenge that uh, for many generations, probably about 200 years, we've fallen into the trap of following styles, being educated as soon as we enter a school of architecture, this is the predominant style. This is what you'll be educated in. We go back generation by generation, whether it's um, modernism, uh, Gothic revival, the Beaux-Arts, neoclassicism, etc. cetera. Uh, and obviously every generation challenges the, the past and, and a new style, if you like, is, 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 is born by those people who might have innovated it, but then there's suddenly a whole sea of uh, uh, conventional education which says, follow it. And that's because art history, opinion makers, Critics, journalists, uh, because our, 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 our sort of um, uh, motivation to categorize, um, uh, give meaning to, 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 to things tends towards that. Uh, uh, my suggestion is that uh, uh, our, 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 our debate was that actually, if you look at Vasari, so 200 years prior to Winkelmann's, so this 200 years, it was all about individuals actually mastering what they're working with understanding their particular um, style. So that's a personal biography, as you were suggesting earlier. Uh, 
that might be uh, a, a, to do with materials and innovation in particular materials you're working with. It might be uh, an idea, a particular idea, so it's entirely theoretical. Uh, uh, but all those aren't necessarily just trapped towards those individuals, but they can disseminate and change. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean universal change, but influence. Um, and to answer your question, <laughs> Uh, I think for uh, at least the two generations, we've lost that as architects. And uh, and if you, I, I'm not saying any of us here are guilty of that, um, but there are there's plenty of architecture you can walk past where even the literacy of of um, if you're using load bearing materials to appear as if they're load bearing, so you've got a steel frame, a concrete frame using brick to make it look like a solid building because everybody likes brick and it looks solid and fits in and all the rest of it. Uh, but somehow the the alignment of that brick, how that brick is then supported over a window or a door opening is not thought about consciously where someone's saying, well, actually, I don't want a lintel there. I don't want to express a lintel. It's just an assumption. Uh, I will render this image, whether it's by hand drawing or, or CAD, in a brick wash, here are some openings. It hasn't even occurred to me that there might have been a soldier course, uh, or flat or arched um, lintel, or even a steel or stone or whatever. All these things are still possible to do because they are the sort of fundamental structural that then led to the style um, solutions. And it's the fact that we've lost it, that then we um, create so much of it if we don't have that literacy, then how do you expect members of the public, who, the then, government. who then become councillors, <laughs> who then become conservation officers yeah. or ministers and government? It's a superficial understanding of it's yeah. Where well, style it's an inevitable. From. It's an inevitable misunderstanding of the etymology of architecture, uh, which is as a result of, dare I say, a great deal of literacy in in, in architects. Because ultimately, we, when people complain about narratives, build, you know, what is a narrative in a, in a building? All buildings have a narrative. Uh, most commercial buildings are the narrative fundamentally is make me profit, but it has to be built. So there's a structural narrative. Uh, so um, if there's an illiteracy in that narrative, um, in the, the appearance of that building, then, then, then we're speaking without literacy to people. So how on earth are they going to understand anything? So inevitably, you have councillors and conservation officers and ministers potentially um, un not understanding the gobbledygook that we're all speaking. Um, so it's it's a it's a requirement to become literate, self-literate, and because all of us can understand it. As soon as you use certain types of materials in a certain way, all of us already have that education to understand immediately. Read a building and understand how it's made, why it's made. Yeah. What it's telling but like us. you said, it's the categorization, the crude sort of categorization yeah. that people get into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any more questions from the audience, please? Have we got time for one or two more? Yes. Uh, if you, uh, there is a mic coming, so if you could just briefly say who you are, please. Thanks. Uh, Jack Hughes. Um, you referenced uh, the fact that you had a relatively small built portfolio, oh, and I, it's for, for an architect at a practice that is obviously trying to push building conventions in a way uh, that's obviously understandable, especially in housing. Um, and as I guess more recently, you've managed to build a fair, fairly, a few projects as, as the practice profile has risen. But I think especially with the way in which London architecture seems to follow the client's pocket of being relatively generic, did you find towards the earlier on that it was very difficult to actually convince people that they needed to invest in both financially and in terms of their time and experimentation with building one-to-one yeah. -one moquettes of things. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. that I can imagine that you probably have a whole ream of developers just saying, no, get, you know, get out of it. <laughs> yeah. We're not doing well, this. The, I mean, this one, obviously, the client is, 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 is running a special design competition and absolutely interested in getting a certain type of result. That's, that's the most expensive. Uh, of the three in terms of pound per square meter. So they have a, spe a special ambition. Uh, 
the conventional uh, ones, uh, Barrett's Grove and even Clark and Wells, actually conventional in terms of construction methodology. It's just that we put it together in a different way. Uh, and uh, ultimately, it's pound per square meter cost. However, even if we persuade uh, clients uh, that stone, first of all, I mean, if they're interested, it's 10% of the carbon footprint of using steel or concrete. Uh, it's 25% cheaper, should be faster. Um, if the client buys into that, he has to tender it. And that's where you then hit the next stumble. So the first stumble is the quantity surveyor and the client, because ultimately the quantity surveyor is um, key nowadays with the project manager because architects are no longer trusted to understand the costs. And uh, really, as an architect, you if, you're, you know, if your title is still team leader, you need to be a team leader and you need to understand your client's criteria. And in, as, as you say, conventional um, housing or commercial uh, building, it's actually not that complex. You know, it's a very simple bank mathematical equation of the profits they require, the costs they're going to buy the, um, the land for um, is, a, is a product of how much it's going to cost and how much profit they're going to, they're going to make at the end of it. Um, so once you understand that and you manage to, to convince your client that you've brought the construction costs down so their profit might be more because they've already bought the land, for instance, uh, they will run with that. The next challenge is then the contractor. The problem is most contractors, I've done this type of construction before, but I've had to do the following with it, and therefore I'll add an extra 20%, and suddenly your saving vanishes. So you really have to uh, persuade contractors. There is another method, which is you also become construction manager, and then you subcontract all the various elements, and you're effectively asking the client to take the risk for, for those. So, it's hard, yeah. So until, and it's slowly happening. So for instance, CLT, CLT is perfectly normal nowadays, but allowing it to be fair face finish for acoustic and fire reasons uh, has been resisted for mostly acoustic and fire reasons, but also under the, um, the guise that actually conventionally nobody wants to buy exposed timber. Uh, but if you can meet those fire and acoustic reasons and convince your client that it can sell, uh, then they save 25% of construction, and that's normally quite a persuasive argument. It would be possible to, I mean, all of the three projects are in London. I know you did CLT on the project on Broadway Market before um, Barrett's yeah. Grove, I think. I, I, do you think that it's, it is something that that's, can be successful in London, but actually yeah, outside yeah. would be a lot trickier? We uh, highly uh, it makes total sense to 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 make buildings out of CLT. Um, uh, extremely fast to con construct. I mean, it's, most of the time it doesn't take more than two three weeks to put up that scale of building. Eight eight working days, I think, has been the fastest. Um, not not specifically CLT, but more just the approach to um, having such a bespoke construction method. Well, it looks, that's the idea. It's bespoke at the moment, but it becomes conventional, yeah, more conventional. Yeah. Is that an ambition to build at a much greater uh, well, scale or work with a volume house builder? Well, I mean? the, the stone version, uh, somebody's asked us, uh, well, we've got planning approval, and I think it's on site now. Um, it's sort of equivalent and a different type of stone, finished differently, um, but load bearing, 10 stories tall. Um, in Camden. Uh, so, yeah, I, it's, I think there's, a, well, I won't, I won't mention who, but a, a large developer came to see us. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Took them around Barrett's Grove, yeah. told them the criteria to make sure this is how you, you make a successful CLT uh, building. Coming back to this team leader business, uh, you need to get your team around that table. So it's acoustic engineer, fire engineer, approved inspector. They need to be sitting around that table all the time because then they, they then input and tell you how to make sure that all these things can happen. Uh, so we did all that, but um, he's using another architect to build. Um... The thing about design and build, uh, it's got a bad name because it's opportunity, the spectrum of doing nothing and handing over one piece of paper which says, build me 20 flats is perfectly possible in a design and build contract. At the other end, you can do the full traditional contractual information and hand that over. But obviously, it's less advantageous for the contractor 
because the one piece of paper gives them all the opportunities to buy the cheapest possible materials, make it in pink where you might have envisaged it to be in blue because you haven't specified it. It doesn't really matter. That's your specification. While the other one is absolutely every single screw, nut and bolt. But still, it's still design and build to time and budget. So as long as that information is in there, it's a legal document, and the client's willing to police it, and you're willing to police it, then there's no reason why you can't deliver what you want. Okay, well, it's nearly time to wrap up, but um, maybe time for just one quick question, if anyone has one. Um, yes, gentlemen towards the back, thank you. Chris Boyce. Um, do you think what happened to you, or what is happening to you in Darkman at the moment, will turn out to be a magnificent piece of accidental PR? Uh, somebody else asked Already me is. that. Uh, somebody else asked me that. Yeah, you, you know, secretly you must be enjoying the. Uh, <laughs> yeah. no, no, I might be grinning about it now, but inside there's. Um, <laughs> A crying, crushed, <laughs> whimpering person. You will win Surrenders. eventually. Mm -hmm. You will win eventually. Well, I hope so, yeah. But still, at the bottom of the piece of paper, it says demolish. Yeah. <laughs> it's absurd. It's as absurd as it is. Yeah, it's completely absurd. But... They've already pulled down one of the columns, haven't they? I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, to us. <laughs> Didn't mean to end on such a flippant note, but um, <laughs> thank you very much uh, to our host tonight, Rocker, who supported this event. And thank you so much to Amin. Please put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.